Hey everyone, I'm Karen Walby Solomon, and welcome to What's IGN Crushing On, IGN Africa's official entertainment podcast. I'm your host, and I'm joined as always by my producer and editor Rebecca Barchers. So, this is a show where we discuss all things entertainment and pop culture with a new guest every week. We bring recommendations, news, and fun facts sometimes touching on the more serious issues surrounding these topics. It's our opening night. You need to make a good impression. Fantuga Af, that's all on this class. That was the trailer of the new film, One Night Kwam Kolisi, which is now streaming on Showmax and DSTV Now. So later on in the episode, we have a conversation with the director and the lead actor of the film, Susan Dehena. But before we get to that, um, you know, we have two interviews per episode now. So this week we chatted to comedian Waylene Bukas, who has been a force on social media with her handle, Waybeline. Everybody knows her little skits and one-liners and jokes so we had an interesting chat about growing up in namibia navigating the comedy industry as a woman and you know just like what show she's obsessed with spoiler alert she really really likes ozark so anyway here's our chat with waylene so hi waylene thanks for joining us on the show how have you been how's 2021 been for you so far Honestly, do you know what, actually? 2020 made me not care about what happens this year. Like, I'm just like, okay, whatever. <laughs> like, people were like, coming, people have asked me, like, what are your plans for this year? My plans? My plans? <laughs> what are like, plans? You, you know, when people are like, I'm taking it day by day. I'm taking it hour by hour. <laughs> like, I'm watching, I'm doing this with you now, and I'm watching Netflix after this. Whatever happens at 10, who knows? I could be in a jacuzzi. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but for now, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> you could be in a whole different province, in a whole different country. That- <laughs> walk over the border. <laughs> actually, the funniest thing is I could actually walk over the border. <laughs> who knows what country I'll be in by By, <laughs> by- <laughs> <laughs> So, so like, I obviously have to ask you because you're my first guest from Namibia. What was it like growing up in Namibia? I mean, I'm very interested. I mean, like, you know, someone even asked me, like, why did I leave? Why did I go start my career in SA? And I'm like, you know, one day as a Namibian child, you're just, like, looking out your window and you look at the desert and you're like, there's fuck all here! <laughs> and you leave. I'm not sure if I can swear on this show. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't even know if I could swear on this. Uh, but yeah, so you just like, you realize there's like nothing to do here. And you just, but it's actually like, I've, funny enough, I've found the older you get them, because I never understood why anyone stayed. When you're younger, you never understood mm. why anyone would want to live here. Then you get older and you go to countries like, and um <laughs> and you see <laughs> i don't want to throw anyone under the bus johannesburg and um you see what the big city life is like and you're like no it's okay i'll go back to my gurus and my desert you know it's not that bad now that i think of it it's not that bad <laughs> our wife is a bit slower than yours but hey we we manage we manage we only have like three mr prices but we're okay we're okay <laughs> So were you like um, always a funny child or, or, you know, was there something that caught everyone by surprise? I think it's, it's, I've had conversations with other female comedians about this. The funniest thing is when you, I think I've always been funny. I've always been creative. Like my parents always used to tell me something like I was very interested in the ads on TV when they would come on. I would like already know what the ad was about before the thing happened. Mm. But it's funny when you're a girl and you're funny or creative, you just, it's, it seemed as, oh, like, it's a cute thing you do. But when you're a guy, it's like, oh, you're funny. You should invest in that. You should do that. Until you later, like, what's 
the funny thing when you get older now, everyone's like, oh, this makes so much sense that you want to do comedy, that you're doing writing and stuff. Mm. But I'm like, none of you told me this when I was growing up. Like, mm. not a single one of you was like, hey, don't go study law, do this. And it's like, <laughs> it's like you guys could have saved me some money, you know? We all could have, like, we could have cut this shorter. But it's, it's, so it's always been there. It's always been, because mm. it's always, everyone also always asks you, like, when is the moment you knew you wanted to do yeah. comedy or when and it's, it's it's always been there. I have no definite moment that I was like, yo, I'm a comedian. I don't. It's a blur of so many things. That's what makes it so like foundational. It's just mm. always been I do, I have no I died my first time like most comics want to lie and say like, oh my gosh, I killed my first time. I said, I died hard. I died. Well, tell hard. Me about I this- remember Tell me about your first gig. I'm so cute. It was so horrible. I remember everything. I remember the host <laughs> was wearing a yellow hoodie. That's how bad my first death was. I remember. And you know, the thing is, it was like this small town, a small restaurant gig. Mm-hmm. None of the big comics ever came there. Um, I was working in events at the time, so I was running the gig. Mm. So that was like, I was like, okay, cool. This is be like my chance to kind of like slip my way into that. So not a lot of big comics were there and stuff like that would normally come to the gig. I'm not lying. That night, that specific <laughs> night I performed. Oh my gosh. Everyone was there. So you have your comedy heroes at the back. And they're all sitting like at the last two tables. And they're just watching me die on stage. Like die, die, die. I'll never forget we were once at the Goliath Comedy Club and Jason Goliath was like, oh, like he's telling the one guy that saw me die, like a mm. big producer. At, he was at the show the first time I performed and Jason's telling him, oh, this girl's funny. And he had this look of, this girl? <laughs> like, I said, this, this girl? No, you must be talking about another girl because I've seen this girl, that I've seen her do her thing. It's it was so bad. I can't even. So they even I don't so, even know. So they remembered you from that time. It was so bad. No, the, it's 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 one of those things like how many colored girls are doing stand up. So <laughs> they were like, yeah, we remember this Asian looking small girl. <laughs> She's very much imprinted into our memory. So, yeah, and it was it was but the the beauty of it was like I kind of got to be an underdog for very, very long, mm. which allowed me to like kind of suck for a while, which was and cool. also work on so it. To, yeah, so you get to no one, everyone's expecting you to die, so you die on stage multiple times. You perfect things besides joke, your jokes. You perfect timing, mm. like entrance, how you move on stage. So I got time to do that, and then start getting better. So the dying was like a blessing in disguise. Look, I wouldn't call it a blessing because it's still dying on stage. It's not called dying. On stage. You st- like I just told you, I have me- I have haunted memories. <laughs> <laughs> These things keep me awake at night. <laughs> but okay, so, 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 you know when people talk about colored people, they talk about people from Cape Town. Yes, and there's like a large community of colored people that don't live in Cape Town. Is it's, that like a stereotype that's also... It's so funny because like even today, like my mom's from Uppington mm-hmm. in the Northern Cape. So she's colored. My dad is Buster, which is like Namibian mm-hmm. color. I don't even... It's not... I just say that because it's easier to explain than the whole... It's a mixture of Khoisan and German and all those. It's same formula, different ingredients. <laughs> 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 basically but what that does is it means we have different so my mom and dad I grew, they have different cultures they grew up different different histories different things so for me to just go like hey I'm colored and erase my buster side because it's hard to explain what buster is is so detrimental to this side and I hate when people just go like oh but colored and buster are the same thing thing I'm not it's not Mm. or going like oh you're just like Cape Town or whatever and also what that happens is now you you have one picture of what a colored girl or colored guy is supposed to look like this yes there's obviously some similarities we carry through with all of us but example when it comes to like features and stuff I have very sharp cheekbones example and small eyes 
when I'm in South Africa, it gets, because people don't know the Buster line comes direct from Khoisan blood. They go like, oh, you have Asian features. I'm like, no, if you knew the sun, people have mm. very sharp cheekbones and small eyes. That's where it comes from. I'm just very light skinned, but it's not Asian heritage. Mm. But people are like, they don't want to learn. They don't want to know. So they're just going to go with what's easier for them or what they want to experience. And the, the second problem also with colored, the whole color thing is our people ourselves are very problematic. Mm. So it's hard to defend or sometimes talk about it because it's like, while we are having the right conversations, we're trying to have the right conversations. On the other side, it's like, going more to the european i always get so mad when i see colored people going to the european mm. side because i'm just like you're not winning that side just come here she's like no sweetie <laughs> it's not for us it's not for us <laughs> i know you think it's for us it's not for us we're losing there as well <laughs> might as well just <laughs> it's like my mom once told me that she's like you must remember one thing about a racist white person. They're racist against everyone. Like, they, like a racist white yeah. person doesn't care if your light skin, doesn't care if your mm. hair is straight, doesn't care if your eyes are brown. If you are not white, you are like not applicable in that. So that's where I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Because it does, because in the end, it's because it goes back to the fact that your race isn't actually what makes them discriminate against you. Mm-hmm. It's exactly. it's so much deeper than that. It's their sense <laughs> of superiority, and exactly. they are superior over all. Exactly. So, so a racist white person talented. doesn't care. It, not you're in the house. It's, it's no point. You're losing. Yeah. You're losing. So you lose, lose on the allies. side. <laughs> exactly. Lose with the allies. Come on. Yeah. Now. Come now. <laughs> um. So, like, I mean, obviously a lot of people have also spoken about how difficult it is for women in comedy. So what has your experience been like? Look, I've worked in entertainment. I used mm. to, like, um, work, did promos, and then I, like, full-on ran events and stuff like that. And then I've also intended a law firm. And then that's when I moved into, after I dropped out, I moved more into the entertainment segment. I will say this. It's not without its faults, but the comedy, the the industry itself with the guys is a way better working environment than the others. I think the issue more comes in with when I have to deal with outside factors like producers and those people and promoters. Mm. But my actual working environment, maybe it's also just my own personal experience. I don't want to speak on anyone else's, but it's been... It's been amazing for me. I have a support system mm. that is I've never had in any other of those working environments. I wear, whereas when you work in a law firm or when you work in entertainment, you always feel like a woman working in this thing. You're always made aware of the fact mm. you're a woman, you are less, and doesn't matter what you do, it it never gets appreciated, it never gets anything. Whereas with the guys sometimes in comedy. They say very, very stupid things. I won't lie. They say very, like, honestly, like, sometimes I'm just like, oh, my gosh, how did you get married? How did someone, how did you, how do you have a life? How are you 50 and have a life? Because the thing's coming out of your mouth. But it's just like, they'll say it once in a while. And then they're like, but they're genuinely pretty harmless most of the time. I've been Um, quite a bit of shows and I've just seen the way the male comics have, like, like sort of like hyped up and encouraged the women Mm. and I was like it's actually very heartwarming to see like and I mean obviously I'm I'm from the outside like as an audience Mm. member and I mean obviously I don't know what it's like for you guys personally but I just I I, I, it seems like a very good like the thing is they know they also like especially the comics you are closer to they know how hard it is for you so they try and not make it even harder but at the same time, they also, I remember when I started, like I said, I died a lot in the beginning. So it was a thing of, there were comics that kind of believed in me, but they were on some, if you want to do this, you need to toughen up. Hmm. So they're like, we're not going to, if you die on stage, no one's going to come up to you and be like, oh, you get him next time, Tiger. You're going to feel what it feels like 
now, early in your career. And if you can't take it now, you're not going to make it further. Mm. I remember like doing gigs in, I was 21 doing gigs in Soweto and you die. And it's like, you're so far from home. You're literally in Johannesburg, also far from your house. You don't speak the neck. You've just died on stage. It's just a, it's just a bad experience. And it's like, they're not, they're not going to go soft on you for this. But mm. then the thing is, I will like that same specific gig. I was like, uh, it was a horrible gig. And I just wanted to go home and stuff like that. And one of the com- comics was like, no, you can't go home alone. You're, you're still in Soweto. You're still like a female alone mm. at 2 a.m. in the morning. We're not letting you go ho- home alone. Like we're not just going to like... <laughs> In that sense, we're not going to let you fend for yourself. But you start, this comedy thing is separate from who you are as a woman. Mm. Like you need to, and that was one of the important things also that I needed to decide. It's like, do you want to be a comedian? Do you want to be a female comedian? Those are two different things. Do you want to play on the female aspect the whole time? Or do you just want to be funny and have people think you're funny? Sorry, I know this is a weird thing to say. My friend works in the mines and her phone keeps going off. So she has to go to the mines right now. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so, so if you keep hearing the laughs, I'm like in a very remote town right now. <laughs> you guys think I'm joking. I'm here by the diamonds. That's why I'm here. I'm trying to get diamonds. Anyway. So he, I, I remember one of the comics was like, got me home. And I was like crying because this was a horrible performance. And still made sure I got home, got home safe, walked me to my gate and was like, yeah, that sucked. And then like, left, like <laughs> just like a reminder, like glad you're home safe, but do better, do, do better next time. And what makes a difference is because it's like in anything in life, I think when you earn people's respect and trust and admiration, it means more than them just giving it freely. Mm. And that has nothing to do, or for me specifically, once again, I don't want to, because I'm not unaware of the fact that being light-skinned, being young makes a difference for me Mm. than other people. So I'm just like, I'd never want to speak on anyone else's experience, but I'm just like having earned, earned it versus it just being freely given is, has made a difference for me. And it also makes a difference when, if you do, because you'll always die on stage. You'll always have bad moments on stage. You'll always not be funny. Twitter reminds me of that daily. Because <laughs> I'll be like, this tweet is a banger. It's going to get the whole squad laughing. And then everyone's like, no, this is, this is bad, really. This was, this was a horrible idea. <laughs> um, it makes you deal with that better. Because you know you've had moments where you were really funny, genuinely funny. And real people laughed at it. Real people cared. People who you look up to, kid. So the bad ones don't even come close to outweighing the good ones. Mm. So, um, so for like young women wanting to get into comedy, I mean, I think that it's really scary. Um, <laughs> what would you advise them? I mean, I think like I mean, obviously, you saying that you you knew you had like sort of like you knew you wanted to do this but I think for most people it's like is it worth the rejection and the pain the one thing I will say is representation matters because like Mm -hmm. I'm not to dive too deeply into it but I didn't I was hanging out with comedians for a long time before I started comedy because I was seeing a comedian Um, but I never saw myself doing comedy. I just, I've always been a comedy fan my whole life. And it wasn't until I saw Lindy perform one night at Kitchener's. And I'm like, I was sitting there and I'm like, this girl is a year older than I am. Colored girl a year older than I am. And she's killing it. And I'm like, I can, like, like, that's my, pers- that's the, the thing I needed to see. I needed to see someone like me do the thing. I think that's all it is. We just need to see more people of us doing the thing and making a space because also comedy is a boys club. As much as I said, the boys are like accepting sometimes, it still is a boys club. They still sometimes talk over you. They still, they're a boys club. They'll always mm. be a boys club in a sense. But so what happens is the more women join, the more, 
women of color join them or we can start our own girls clubs and stuff and we don't yeah. need their spaces we don't need their um approval like it's like i said it's nice to get it but it's like when you reach to the point where you go i know what i bring to the table i know i'm funny you don't need their constant mm. thank yous or, or approvals so it's just i think we just need everyone needs to just see themselves doing the thing also what i would like i would just i would like to see more i know this is going to sound messed up i'd like to see more average people of color in entertainment like not like not in the sense of like looks or anything but just like talent was also cuz i'm like mm. there's so many mediocre straight men and stuff yeah. doing a thing like they get to do it they don't get scrutiny for it um i remember it's like if i'm on the lineup with another woman of color it's automatically we're against each other without us even having said it or done it maybe that's also just what i feel but it just automatically now becomes this thing it's like now we're being scaled against each other and we have to like then we can't do okay you're not allowed to do okay mm. we have to do great we have to do great whereas everyone else can kind of just not die on stage and they'll be okay so it's just like i just want us to have more average just to balance it out i think just to like equal mm. the scales because it's like every single person of color i know doing things and black people that i know doing things in entertainment they have to be exceptional they're not allowed to just be you're not allowed to be a bc student you have to be an a plus student and that gets exhausting sometimes i mean i've been feeling it with my own content so you're like i don't want to put stuff out because it's not like this amazing thing or if it doesn't do great i get into a vibe and i'm like no delete this this did horrible mm. because you're not allowed to put out anything mediocre you just have to give a grade material all the time and that's not sustainable. Mm, that's so true. So um when you when you writing material like from your own life because I mean mm. I've seen new sets where you've talking about dating. And like, <laughs> like how do you decide what to use? Like how do you cross that line between okay this is this okay. is this is something I can use as material and, or this is something I don't really want to share with other people? I'm not even going to lie that is still a tricky line to mm. cuz even now even with just the stuff that happened in 2020 and some things are so specific that even if look the broader audience won't get it but there's people who know me personally that will be like oh no we know exactly who you're talking about um but the one thing I've just learned is like in some like I had an ex who lost it who I didn't even make a joke on stage I made a tweet about it and he sent me a message and he said he said my my heart is as dried up and dead as the namab desert or has been hardened by the namab desert for many years um <laughs> but like in that case was also just I would have tweeted just, that afterwards I did also I was like I made a whole thing I made a whole thing cuz I'm like this is ridiculous because the thing also of that was he got mad about me speaking out about something he did to me. Mm. And I'm like you don't get to dictate how I deal with my pain. Mm. I try to change the names on stage or not use names when I talk about personal experiences. But what you do to me as a person that's on you. You can go on. You can also go do comedy or write a song or whatever you need to do if you want to mm-hmm. tell your version of it or whatever. It's fine. Um it gets for me it's not even relationship the relationship ones i don't care that much but it's more about the family ones you know also growing up colored it's like a thing of oh you're not allowed to talk about this and this and this mm. we're not allowed to disc- like these things are not allowed to be spoken about like yeah like i'm not even, i can't even tell you like one of my funniest jokes is like the way my grandmother died and i'm not allowed to talk about it on stage because my family was like no you're not allowed and i'm like but that's what happened and it's hilarious um yeah so they don't let me talk about that and i'm like i could be famous um 
<laughs> but like it it gets trickier with that it gets a mm. bit tricky but then at the same time I'm also just like but it's also like my as much as it's also once again it's my life so I should yeah. be able to talk about my life as much as I want to but you have to be you have to be cautious because it's it's the same thing how much how much does a person mean to you if you're willing mm. to talk about them or the experience on stage you must be also willing to lose them yeah because it's their right to also be like yo so everyone I've like especially when it comes to my dating stuff most of those guys I talk about like they don't mean anything so and it's also been I know it's funny occurrences but it's been the lighter ones so it's mm-hmm. not even been like my real heartbreaks or stuff like that because those ones are a bit personal and not yeah. funny I've tried <laughs> you know there's a fine line you know there's a fine line when you're on stage and you tell a joke and you can feel the audience go oh, shame that oh, shame is worse than you dying on stage because that just means people feel sorry for you and you're like oh my gosh that was that was not cool <laughs> <laughs> went to a um like a workshop thing with Lauren Bukas and she was like you have to write as if your parents are dead and like I was quite young then and I took that literally and then I and then <laughs> after a couple of like blog posts and the shit they went on afterwards my sister was like no that's white people <laughs> you need to understand you cannot write as if your parents are dead <laughs> even when your parents die oh, you still write about as if they're alive <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I get that fine line. It is so, so fine. It is so fine. It is just like it gets tricky because it's also like oh, the funniest comedy comes from truth. Yeah. The funniest comedy comes from truth and you're like I'll be sitting on some fire jokes and I'll be like damn. I can't even Like you know, I had covid. I can't make any jokes about it because it's like I don't know how to not cross the line. Yeah. Like and it was like something funny ever like the one funny thing that happened. I went to the gate. I had my phone in my one hand. And then I coughed into my other hand. And I was outside and I was like and my mom was like, "Get bring it like covid in your AC." And I'm like, "No, I'm there." With the covid in my one hand. And I'm like, "Yo, what am I going to do with this covid? We am I like what am I going to I've got my phone. I can't send. I can't go back into she'd me no cuz I can't in AC and honey. And I'm standing there with the COVID in the one hand, and I'm just like, and I'm like, oh, you know, Eli, they must say COVID burns in the sun. So now I'm opening my hand, and I'm just standing in the sun there for like about 20 minutes, just like burning the COVID out. <laughs> like, because my mom told me I can't come back into the house with that. <laughs> and what kills me is like we all already had COVID, so I'm like, what's more? What's a little sprinkle of COVID on the other COVID we already had? <laughs> and so those are jokes that you're dying so much. <laughs> like, oh my God. Uh, and I'm like, that's funny now in conversation with you. But I was like, I was figuring, I'm like, go and type it, you go and tweet it. I don't have a stage. This is the closest thing I'm getting to telling some jokes. So that's also another thing. Because online funny and stand up funny is two different things. With mm. stand up or talking to someone, I can explain. You can get a bit more context. Now, example, I just talk about that joke. It comes across as insensitive to some people mm. and stuff like that. But then you go like, "It's my COVID, brah. I'm, I should be allowed to deal with it." So like, I know if you may say, "Oh, my COVID, to deal with me." So okay, so um, so back to your like career and stuff. <laughs> What would you say has been like your highlights this far? Um, I know it has nothing to do with me, but like meeting Dave Chappelle was really cool. No, it, has not, it had no impact on my career whatsoever. But I was, I met the guy. I was like, I met the guy. What is he like? I met the guy. I, I lived. It was, it was the. So he came down. The Global Citizens. I remember the Global Citizens was the Sunday. He had a private party the Saturday night, like so we were all there. But it's like you couldn't interact with him, whatever. But it was a very nice like experience, very great music experience. And like towards the end of the night, like people are leaving now. The party's done. It was in Joburg at Carfax. You know those places they have like shared bathrooms. It's just like the one bathroom. 
Mm -hmm. It's not like guys or girls. So I was wearing like a jumpsuit thingy. So now um, I come out of the bathroom store. My friend is busy zipping me up. Um, She, she, I told her about this joke. She, like, she told me something that I added to a joke. So she was like, oh, what's the joke? So I'm busy telling her the joke while she's slipping me down and I'm bent over. As I'm done, I look up. I see a bounce, a big bouncer by the bathroom door. And right, like, next to me is Dave Chappelle washing his hands. And he just gave me, like, a nod. And he left. So I don't, I don't know if that's technically meeting him. But to me, that was me meeting him. Oh, and the worst part is the joke was in Afrikaans, so he didn't understand a thing I said. So couldn't tell me if I was funny or not because the joke was in a different language. Did he oh. yeah, does he maybe speak Afrikaans? Maybe, maybe because he gave me like a nod of approval. So I'm like, <laughs> which I'm or a nod of acknowledgement that you're a human being that's also here. I don't know what the nod meant, <laughs> and I will the one day ask him about like that nod. <laughs> I think so. He's not gonna. He's not here to to confirm or deny. Just believe what you want to believe. No, but go. <laughs> Dave, that was follow. dope. The other thing was like, even if it it's just seven minutes, it's the fact that I got to like be like film stand up for TV for Showmax, and it like properly professionally filmed set thing that it's 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 different from the recordings you do at shows or stuff like that, even if, and it is one, it actually is one of my best performances ever. Um, So it's just nice to have like a concrete, like if someone asks me, hey, I want to watch you, where can I watch you perform? I can be like, hey, go on Showmax. Is this the first pop? pop. Oh yeah. Yeah, first pop. So I'm like, hey, go watch that. It's just a nice hard piece of evidence that this isn't just a hobby anymore. Cause there's no like, you don't graduate in stand up. Mm. You don't like you just do it for years and then people start going, Oh yeah, she's a comedian after a while. There's no there's no formal thing. We don't wear robes. It's just it's just you just have to do it long enough that people believe it and that you believe it. So that was cool. Um yeah, the cool thing about stand up is like you get to do so many other cool things. I've gotten to do so many cool things. Um writing for tv and like just filming being casted and stuff it's just all of it is just so cool all the time i think that's why i miss it so much as well i miss my life Mm. Um, (laughs) because it's just like every day it's just like hey and the thing about comics that i love more about other people in entertainment Comics are most most are down to earth people or very chilled people. So mm. my friend has a radio interview or something. He'll be like, "Hey, come with, come meet these people," and then you meet those people, and then next time those people are like, "Hey, you come on next time," and then you're like, "Oh, so it was this easy." <laughs> so it all had. So I'm like, "Yeah, okay." So that's all you have to do to do this. You just kind of have to, you just have to be in people's faces long enough for them to be like, oh, "Just put on TV, man." Like. Ugh. Just get out of the way, man. She's in the frame already. Just put her in the thing. <laughs> and then that's how you end up on MTV. <laughs> you just stand there long enough till someone's like, oh, just put her on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she'll go away if you put her on for a few minutes. <laughs> so, um, what, like, what comedians inspire you? So, what I learned doing comedy is comics that I find hilarious, like proper hilarious. Then there's comics that inspire me and my work specifically. Mm. So there's obviously, I like, I love Dave Chappelle. I love Richard Pryor. I love all those guys, like the older guys. Mm. But when it comes to me as a young woman of color, it's, their work doesn't impact my work, if that makes sense. Mm. They're great, but like as like I enjoy them as a comedy lover. But for me, comedic wise, people who influence me as Ellie Wong, John Mulaney, um, Daniel Sloss, uh, mm. Dylan Willifant. Um, trying to think now. I also like I draw a lot of inspiration from my peers as well, or like the people I work with. Like one thing I've learned: South African comedians are actually way better than international comedians sometimes because like you'd get guys who are headliners 
overseas and stuff, and then they come here. Okay, I have this analogy, best way to explain it. If I don't even watch UFC, but it explains it the best. So if you, you have weight classes in UFC, so you've got your, I don't know, babies, beginners, your middle class, and then your heavyweights. I don't know the names, Karen. Uh-huh. I don't like watch you. Babies, okay. But, okay. but you, <laughs> if you get like the, <laughs> but you get the, but I don't you know enough the, to predict. You the, like the levels, the three like, levels. <laughs> <laughs> you were also like, maybe it is baby class. Um, <laughs> so if you take, so their overseas heavyweights are your Chris Rocks, your Jimmy Cars, those names, Jim Jeffries, all those big, big names. And, you, and then, We've got our big names as well. But then you take the middle class, middle class comics and our middle class comics and they go head to head. I was like murder them over the top. Only their greats are great, if that makes sense. But then everyone else after that is like not great at all. I've seen enough international comics come here and bomb. And then you're like sitting there, they're getting paid so much to be here. Mm. And they're just bombing and we're supposed to be in third world countries. And you're like, oh, but you're like coming from the States. You're coming from England. You're, you're this well-traveled comic who makes a living out of this. And I shouldn't be thinking I can do this better than you. Mm. You get what I mean? I shouldn't yeah. be like, oh, no, this guy's taking up so much time. Can he end this set? I should be in awe. I should be seeing something new, different, I guess. Um yeah, so that's why I draw a lot of inspiration from the comics in the scene as well. They've helped me so much. It's just amazing. One of the things I also unlearned was before I did stand-up, I used to easily say, oh, this guy isn't funny. Mm. This comic isn't funny. Or like if you go like, oh, this is my favorite comic. I'm like, oh, I don't find him that funny. I don't think he's funny. Then you do stand-up and you realize for someone to, example, get a Netflix show, all the steps, all the amount of prep and stand up and years of work that has to go into that before they can so maybe I just don't find that person funny but somewhere somehow that person has to be funny because there's no way you can make it that far without being funny there's just there's too many blocks and the only commodity comedians work in is funny like they they only respect funny so you don't get Netflix doesn't call you and give you a special because you've got a million followers on Instagram. They don't care about that. So yeah. someone has to be funny. So I think to all degrees, every comic that we know is funny. They might just not be funny to you, but it's it's tough. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I realized I can talk about comedy like the whole day. The whole day. That's, I think that's where my dates don't end with me getting laid <laughs> ends with me going home and watching more comedy <laughs> yeah. sadly like sadly for whoever's listening to this that that comedy is one of my favorite subjects as well. I just find it so fascinating so I'm like yeah talk about it forever so okay so what what have you watched recently that you can recommend mm. why am I going blank now okay um, I started The Undoing, which I also saw on your thingy. Quite mm. nice. I love Nicole Kidman playing a white woman. It's just like, oh, she plays a white woman so well. Yeah. So well. Like, she's she a she rich white so woman. Well. Yes. Yeah, like, uh, and always having marital issues. I'm like, yes, Nicole. Like, not yes, but yes. Uh, <laughs> so that's been pretty cool. We've been doing this thing, me and my housemates, so like watching, um, horror movies like mm. every night before we sleep and just like but the thing is i they're so hilarious the people i live with are so hilarious it's like we roast the things happening in the horror <laughs> movies and it's like this white guy who was like sitting on the bed watching um hereditary and he's going through like the most and he's like obviously like getting possessed and stuff like that and my one friend just goes like mm. COVID. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> and you can't make us laugh at this now. <laughs> so yeah, I've been doing that. That's been cool. What else? Is- I think it's this thing of there's so much to watch on Netflix mm. these days and stuff. It's just, you just get caught up so much. I've been re-watching The Office as well. That's always good. That's always great. I want to start Lupin. I haven't seen it. Looks good. Everyone says it's good. 
Yeah, and it's also um, the trailer thing on my Netflix. Yeah. Like, you know, when you keep... I'm, I'm, yeah <laughs> i'm in that phase you know when you've watched too binge too many series for a while now you're just watching movies mm. i'm watching movies now because it's like after bridgerton and all of that i was just like okay let's let's take i loved bridgerton but it, it, they, they could have shaved 20 minutes off each episode they could have they could have they really could have they could have snipped it up they could have shonda could have she could have gotten the scissors on that one that one was it was good. It was good, but it was, it was like twenty like, minutes yeah. of just like six. Like exactly, and I'm like, I don't, I don't, you know. And it's so mean because it's a pandemic. Not all of us are living that life right now. And I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to see this all the time, Sean. I get it. I'm single. I'm, I get it. I'm sitting here watching Bridgerton by myself, eating chips. I know. I'm here. I can see it for myself. You don't have to rub it in my face. And I also, obviously, rewatched Ozark recently again. It's my favorite show. I think it's oh. great. It's amazing. Yeah. I, like, I've, I think I've rewatched it about five times now. Sure. Yeah. I, love I think Jason it's because I want to. Yeah. I think I want... The thing about Jason Bateman is it's like it's a, he's... He, every role he plays is like he accidentally landed in a situation and they just happened to be cameras like it's just like he's just it's <laughs> he just walked into something and then people started filming and that is my his sarcasm and everything I'm just like oh it's so amazing I haven't seen also I think I just wanna sorry I just, I just wanna loan yeah I wanna loan the money that's why I watch it I like, hope is, one day Sars doesn't watch this podcast. <laughs> Find like, out. <laughs> I just want to know what he's like in a drama, though. I've been. I've never he's seen. so. I think that's why I loved it so much. Sorry, <laughs> he's so. He's he's different, but it's the same. He's the same. If you remember him, like in Arrested Development and mm. in um, Horrible Bosses, it's like the same character, but just in deeply serious situations. But it's like he does it so 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 well like so so well it's just he's great in it i think he, he's, he's probably like this like very good like straight man like mm, yeah, that makes sense <laughs> no no that is in like sexuality as in like but also okay. <laughs> but also, a straight white man <laughs> but he just like so like when comedies you'd be like the straight man and everybody else is like zany and like yes the dakers um what, what's that What's it? One of the squeaky voices' name? Dave. The, the I don't know. I, don't, I think his name is Dave. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> why? It's squeaky voice. <laughs> yeah, it's squeaky voice. So they all like squiggly next to him, and he's just like this. But now he's like this. But like everybody else. Yeah. Is like this, so. <laughs> <laughs> he is always kind of serious. I'm like yeah. acting <laughs> out to you, and like the <laughs> podcast. And that's why I'm dying. <laughs> She's like squiggly. She's she's literally making the one hand squiggly. <laughs> it's the one scene where he, I think the best description of his whole character in Ozark is that one scene in Horrible Bosses where they're getting, where the police are questioning him. Mm. And they're like, why were you speeding past the thing? And he's like, I was drag racing. <laughs> they're like in a Prius. <laughs> He's like, I'm not a very successful drag racer. That that is his whole vibe in Ozark. And it's like he's a drug dealers and mafia and FBI, and he's just on some. Yeah, I was drag racing. <laughs> the whole movie. That's uh, the whole show. That's <laughs> that's him, Marty Bird. The whole movie, the whole show. Just I was drag racing. <laughs> so, what do you say your like all time favorite movie is? Parasite. I know mm. it's Parasite. Before that, it was Mulan. Mm. The animation. Like, I rem- remember when Edgar's, I don't know if they did it in South Africa, but Edgar's year used to have like a kitty section. Um, mm. And they play the Disney movies and stuff like that, that they were also selling. So I remember my mom was shopping. I was about four or five and Mulan was playing. But by the time we had to go home now, Mulan wasn't done. It's the first and only time I've thrown a tantrum. I was like, no, we're not leaving. I need to know how this thing ends. I need to know 
how I need to know if they defeat the Huns. <laughs> I need to know this. Got the cassette tape. I watched it every single day till like it was stolen, which I don't believe. I think my mom just told me it was stolen. I don't think it was stolen. I don't think she stole the our cassette. <laughs> like with J Lo, <laughs> a dog. R I P. R I P. J Lo went to the farm. <laughs> My parents are such con men. How can they tell me that? How can they tell me they took the dog to the farm when we don't even have a farm? Who does that? Who does that? J Lo's on the farm. Whose farm? <laughs> And then they would tell me dreams. They'd be like, "Oh, say yah is cop." I'm like, "What? Whose farm is this? We never go with city people." <laughs> I just said, and why did you just take my dog to the farm without <laughs> telling me? So yeah, Mulan. Jello's on the farm watching Mulan right now. Um, and then I think it was the I don't know. There's so many things that even till now that was said in the movie that just stick with me. Like when her dad tells her the the. The flower that blooms in adversity is the most beautiful of all. So every time I do go through adversity or stuff like that, I'm just like, I will come out better on the other side, as cliche as it might sound. Um, that song, let's get down to business, to defeat the Huns, is one of my favorite songs ever. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> Mushu and Kriki's relationship. I think I've I've just always been drawn to comedy because I was. It, toddler and i was like these the the low key moments were so hilarious to me like there's this one part where mushu feels betrayed and he's just like everyone's lying to me everyone's lying to me and he points to the horse and he's like and what are you a cow and i'm just like that's so funny because it's not a cow it's a horse um <laughs> like, it's just hilarious all the time and Yeah, and then Parasite for obvious reasons. Parasite just blew my mind. I don't think I've seen anything like it. I don't think I ever will. And it was just, it was just great. It was just full blown great. And then a movie I know out of my head, word by word, is John Tucker Must Die. Oh, I can excellent. recite that whole movie. Cinema, excellent movie. <laughs> like greatness, greatness. Like all the elements you need in a teen rom com, just there, right there. <laughs> So, who's your first celebrity crush? Mm, let's think now. I, do cartoons don't count, ne? Eh? Cartoons can count. Yeah. Okay, so definitely first Cusco from Emperor's oh. New School, which really set the tone for what happened later in my life when it came to dating. It's just like. Skinny like guys, <laughs> narcissistic skinny guys. They're just like <laughs> from wealth. Who come from wealth. <laughs> just, <laughs> just the tone. The tone was set there. <laughs> and then Michael Sarah, when I became like more a teenager, and yeah. then that also just set the tone. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, like people actually crush on him. I thought it was like a like like a meme. No. I actually, when I, like, I think it was Super Bad. Super Bad was the first movie I saw. And I was just like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. <laughs> But it's also because I think it was also like I was younger. I was, he was a relatable character in age. Because mm. it's like, and also he was achievable. <laughs> he still feels achievable. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the nice thing about Michael Cera. He seems achievable. <laughs> and he's always like doing weird. He always looks like, No one told him, you know, when you like when someone's like, "Hey, let's quickly drive somewhere," or we're quickly just gonna go, and then you end up going somewhere you weren't supposed to be wearing slippers and a gown to, and he's always like that. He's always like, "You guys should have told me to go change first. Like, why didn't you guys tell me this is what we were doing?" He always has that vibe, and I'm just like, "Oh, come here! I just want to take care of him." <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you so much. I've never. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep talking nonsense, bro. That's my specialty. I do this for a living. It's just talk nonsense. <laughs> I'll never forget this one day. Um, someone was like, "Yeah, um, they were trying to insult us. They were like, we were a few comedians. They're like, yeah, you comedians just talk nonsense. You're basically just clowns.'" 
you know, one friend who had so much clown knowledge. We were like, why do you have so much clown knowledge? He's like, hey, you actually have to go to clown college to be a clown. You have to like, and we're like, why do you know so much about clowns? <laughs> and why are you defending clowns instead of defending clowns? Clowns come from like, it's not that essential. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all. He's like, Clownery. You can't just be. You can't just become a clown. You need to be flexible to be a clown. You need to have a certain set of skills to be a clown. And we're just like, yeah, yeah. Now you're just making clowns make more money than comedians. We're like, whoa, dude. Which they do. Clowns make more money than comedians. Oh, well, but where do you? Get, what do clowns do? Do they go to parties? Yeah, but like so it depends stuff. on what level. It depends on what level clown you are. I'm assuming there's like degrees of clownery. <laughs> so like, I think when you start out, like your starter clowns are like the, the kiddies bodies does balloons, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And as you move high, you get like your circus clowns, but they're not really here. They're like overseas and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And then like your top, top level clown is someone who keeps texting back someone that played them. That's like advanced level. Clowner, that's it. on that note. I ended <laughs> Thank on a you lot. so much. Yes. <laughs> I've been Wayleen because you guys have been a lovely audience. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh! Thank you so much, Wayleen. That was lovely. So that was our chat with Wayleen. You can find her on Twitter at at stillwaybeleen or on Instagram at maybe underscore it's underscore waybeleen. The links to everything discussed will be in the show notes. Now we have our interview with Sasanda. Sasanda is an actor, writer, director, producer who has been in everything from Rogue to Inconceivable to Deep State. His new film, One Night Kwam Kholisi, tells the story of a group of university friends who get together one night to celebrating the opening of one of their friends' new restaurants. Um, he's like a, a he, he'll explain more in the interview, but he's like a, a rugby player turned restauranteer. We know those, we've seen those, we've gone to their restaurants. But over the course of the evening, the pressures of secrets between the groups, the group of friends surmounts to a breaking point. It's really good and it's and it's really entertaining. You can, as I said, catch it on Showmax or on Dee's TV now. So here's our chat with Sasanda. So hi Sasanda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Karen. It's amazing to be here. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I've got my spiced chai latte with me <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to chat to you. So so how have you been? Like, how has this um, COVID lockdown experience been like for you? You know what, Karen? It's been crazy busy. So mm. w- when lockdown started March last year, I had started filming on uh, Inconceivable. Uh, mm. Mnet's Inconceivable. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the show, if you know about it. Yeah. And it's it's crazy. Like, I've been, I've been super busy. So even when lockdown happened, I actually really enjoyed the first month. Mm. It's funny how, like, things slow down, like, to a halt. But I, I felt like for the first time in a long time, I had time to sort of reconnect with the things that I really wanted to do and that were important and there were less mm. distractions. Anyhow, we went back to filming Inconceivable and uh, now it meant we pushed out the dates by a month and I had a project waiting for me straight after Inconceivable, which then also had to push out its dates mm. by a month. And that's uh, a romantic comedy called Glen Karua, oh, the okay. second installment. So I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, the first, the first Glen Karua did quite well as a gig net film um, starring Tim Teron. And this one has Leandre Durant in the lead. And uh, so I reprised my role playing his best friend with whom they run a small production company and we shot in the crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I I went in to make One Night Bum Police. I was on that movie set when I got the call to uh, direct the movie. And that, that, that was the first invitation to just direct the film. Sure. So, so you weren't starring in it yet? Yes. So, okay, so, so, so tell us about the film. Tell us um, what it's about. So the movie One Night from Policy, as mm-hmm. sort of the title suggests, uh, One Night 
a, a bunch of uh, university friends who are also basically three couples, three and a half couples, uh, get get together. They haven't seen each other in a while to celebrate Mkulisi's uh, opening his new restaurant. Mm. Uh, Mkulisi is a professional rugby player who played like essays under 21. Uh, that's when, you know, he's got a Springbok rugby jersey and, and he's been playing pro, pro rugby since. Uh, he's at the end of his career and basically he's put everything he's got into this restaurant. Well, in fact, he, him and his wife have put everything into, into this restaurant and, and it's, it's named after him. But it's really, it's, it's their restaurant. Mm. And uh, the wife is played by Linda Mtoba. Um, and she, she plays uh, Lerato. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the friends that, that come through, at first we meet uh, Brian and uh, Funi, which is, Brian is played by Nyanu Sotete. Funi is played by, um, by Funu Mugovani who you would probably maybe you'd have seen her in seriously single mm. and uh Yaniso is in black is king king i believe yes mutlati mutlati is in how to win christmas uh, you we used to be on isi bingo uh and then Busha samuels as well as donovan goliath and there's a very unique uh, uh, cameo featuring role there played by Micaiah henna who is my oldest son he plays oh. son to uh, Fulu son to to Fulu and Yaniso's character. Yeah, was he in the trailer? Is it because I know he's the child. boy in the trailer. Yes, yes. so cute, so adorable. Yeah, that's my son. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So was he excited to be part of of? Yes, he was very very excited. Look, so they've been coming to movie sets uh, from a young age, right? So because every now and then, obviously, your kids will come to work with you. You know. Mm. Um, and uh, he's been, he's been a very artistic kid from a young age. Loves music, uh, you know. He knows an Adele album back to front, <laughs> all the lyrics, all the words. Like, so he's and he loves watching movies and reading. He's so intuitive. I remember bringing him to the set of Inconceivable. I mean, he's only could already follow the plot line and this character is doing mm. that and this character is doing that. Absolutely love it. So yeah. He, he was very excited to be a part of it. So, so you said that you were called to direct first. So, it, was that like your? So, that was your first introduction to the film. Um, yes. So, the introduction to the film. Um, then, I, yeah, I was invited to to direct the film, and uh, a colleague of mine from a previous project had recommended me. And I was so happy, and, and like, I really liked the concept read the script and I enjoyed it. And I immediately climbed in and I said, hey, can I make a few changes to the script myself? Mm. Um, and then, you know, having written a screenplay myself uh, before, I was really uh, excited to just make sure this movie uh, lifts off the page and really comes to life in, uh, in a special way. So then, uh, yeah, we, uh, then we started pre-production on the film. So... Let me tell you the story about the casting. So mm. initially, I had other ideas on how I wanted to cast the film. Uh, but in the further discussions with uh, the, the studio and channel, they we, we found each other, sort of found this look that we now have in the final product. So initially, I wasn't part of the cast, you know. Mm. And the more we discussed who these characters are and where they're from, I remember one day changing my presentation and putting my picture in there, <laughs> saying that I think I should play that, that lead, lead role, yeah. How difficult is it to direct yourself? Uh, it is <laughs> more so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Um, I, I just, I think, yes, on a, on a bigger budget with much more time to shoot, I, I think definitely a lot of things will be easier, including directing uh, and acting. But I have to say, like, it's such a collaborative movie, this, mm. because my my cast was so giving and such great team players that they would support me a lot. Mm. So my co-actors, I remember even Yanis on one day, he had rapped already and... There's a scene we had spoken about during rehearsals 
And I said, hey, man, we're shooting that scene tonight, you know, for the next two hours or so. Um, can, can, can you stick around? And in fact, he offered, he said, hey, I'm going to stay. And he did. Mm. And like, he gave me some incredible tips that, uh, you know, that scene has made the cut and it looks really, really good. And even behind the scenes, I, I had my editor was on set every day and he was also my stand-in. So one, I had to have a stand-in, mm. and which means, so he would, I don't know if you know how stand-ins work, but basically the stand-in will block the scene as, as if it's you and I will be able to, I'll watch it on the monitor and I might, so then I can make all director, directorial changes. Mm. And once we're happy with how it, it flows and how we want to shoot it, we then swap seats. He then goes to the director's chair and I go and act because now we, we're filming the scene. Mm. And that was the dance we were doing most of the time, you know. And I would get extra tips from him and my script supervisor, you know, because they were behind the monitor and I would get tips from him. And I worked closely with my director of photography. Mm. So the it, it, it was definitely about teamwork because the director of photography was Dino Benedetti. We, we communicated a lot, you know, about how it looks and what he thinks, et cetera. Uh, my, first, my first AD, the, the script supervisor and my editor, they were all on set, you know, helping sure. because you do have to take off the other hat in order to do the other thing properly. Mm. So I quickly have to take off the director's hat and be an actor and then have to be completely immersed in that moment until someone cuts or they forget to call cut and then I have to call cut <laughs> because, you know, I'm the director. And once I've called cut, I then switch to my directing hat and I might watch 30 seconds of playback. Yeah, that's, that mm. was the dance. So what do you think you prefer? Do you prefer, prefer acting or directing? Karen, I'm going to say, you have to ask George Clooney the same. <laughs> you have to ask uh, uh, even, I suppose, Ben Affleck. Wait, mm. I'm, there's, there's one other actor-director. He has made um, A Star is Born. Oh, Bradley Cooper. You see now, there we go, you see. Ask Bradley to stop acting. Or ask Bradley to, just to stop directing. He, he wants to do both. Or ask Kanye West to not rap anymore. <laughs> he must just make the beats. Or ask him to just rap and not make beats and see what happens. <laughs> but is it like a relief if you, when you're acting, that you don't have to sort of like, like say if you're acting and somebody else is directing, like it's not yes. your baby. So it's like you can just immerse yourself in the role. It's, it's very true. It's yeah. very true. Um, I did a movie called Rogue. Mm. Uh, which which has Megan Fox in it, yeah. and uh, I don't know if you've seen the billboards or it's yes, it's I'm a Showmax sure. yeah. movie as well, a and a Lionsgate movie with uh, Megan Fox called Rogue, and that's directed by um, M J Bassett, and she so yes, it was definitely a relief to not be carrying that movie on my shoulders as a mm. director because it's an action movie, you know, and it's not that I would never direct action, but it was definitely a relief and I could just immerse myself uh, in that, particularly if, 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 if I'm also doing an accent and uh, it was my first sort of full-on action feature film mm. leading role, you know? So, um, yeah, sometimes it's definitely a relief when it's not, it's somebody else's baby to direct. So I did want to ask you, like, um, when it comes to roles that you choose, like, I, I was watching Checkers recently, and um, you were so good yes. in your role. But, um, like, yeah. what kind of roles do you prefer? Do you prefer the villainous roles or the um, or the more, like, good guy-ish? I prefer everything that's multi-layered, mm. that's, 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 that's challenging, eclectic, uh, and, 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 and I can see a real life person in it. Mm -hmm. So, so no, I, I don't have a particular type of character. In fact, I want to play so many different characters 
it's it scares me like there's so many different types of roles that i want to play so after trackers i did get a few requests to kind of reprise the trackers role mm. in other productions and 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 people sort of liked that so much in that they wanted me to do the same thing and uh, i didn't want to do the same thing because i i've done it you know yeah. and uh and the reason why, also, if you, if you look at trackers, so in the beginning, I was asked to audition for both parts, for the parts of Quinn, mm. the, the, the police officer guy, uh, or the role of uh, Julius Nkunzi Shawango. Mm. And I knew from the beginning, I was like, I've played that good guy. Yeah. I am not interested in playing him at all. I want to try that, my hand at that. I've I've not played it, so let let let's go for it, and that and that's what I went for. No, yeah, no, that was amazing. <laughs> I get why you pick that role. It's like the it's also so juicy. Yeah, very juicy. I yeah. really really enjoyed it. Listen, <laughs> here's another juicy role that um, we made a series called Agent, which is streaming on Netflix. Mm. Which is made for SABC and a French uh, Canal Plus. Uh, Canal Plus is a is a is a French network that also broadcasts in, in the French colony. Well, the the French speaking countries in Africa. Mm. Uh, but now it's it streams on Netflix. Uh, it's called Agent. But the role I play there that's that, that's why I brought this up. Lise uh, Homoleko. Oh my gosh! If do yourself a favor. Please watch it, that see like season it one. Yeah, you gotta check out that guy. In fact, we might do a whole episode on on that series alone, which at the moment is actually we we are submitting for some international Emmy awards. So okay. yeah, we look forward to yeah. what happens there. So, so tell me what what is Agent about? Yeah, Agent is a drama series about uh, follows a a ex football star who's become an agent oh. and uh, he, he now represents some of the players he used to play, he used to play with, but now he's the agent and uh, it's the drama behind the scenes of, of looking after football stars, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, you know, a picture Jerry Maguire meets any given Sunday and, and and that's 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 all the drama there. Um, I play the the star footballer who basically makes a ton of money, but he's basically such a hick to look after <laughs> as a client uh, because he's so he's messy, you know. If you understand mm. what I mean, from an agent's point of view. I know that sounds really interesting. I'm definitely gonna. But he that. makes all the money. All the girls, you know, all the women love him. He's got all the cars and the houses and uh yeah so it's it's all the drama off the pitch Mm. so you have worked in like almost all the facets like of the industry like what would you like to do next (sighs) that's such a lovely uh question so i want to make with a friend of mine many years ago I am, my role would be two things, obviously executive producer because we created it and uh, as, as, as well as storyliner, writer and, and the lead actor. Mm. Um, I'm really excited about that. And, and there's two feature films I want to make this year. And I, and I'm, and I, I think I'm, I'm definitely ready for some uh, studio and uh, superhero movies. Mm, yeah. I can definitely see that, though. Uh, so how do you know that, you know, like like acting, the entertainment industry, how did you know that was for you? Like, like how did you decide to go into that? It, it screamed at me because, okay, high school in uh, what used to be known as a Standard 9 or Grade 11 now in Grade 12, in fact, from uh, a standard age, which is grade 10, 11, and 12, I'd been doing these skits at school with 
with my best friend at the time. So we would just write these skits and then we would just we would just perform them. After a while, the school started inviting us to perform them at assembly. So in, in front of 600 kids, um, we, we would then get on stage at the end of assembly and, and make the school laugh for like seven minutes where we were on stage and, and playing out like multiple characters. <clears throat> so that's when I knew that I have to do this. And then I did an inter-house play, I think in grade 10, for which I won Best Supporting Actor. And, uh, and I, I knew, I definitely knew that I have to follow this. But... Uh, when I when I finished matric in ninety nine and uh, th- then I went to college, I didn't study drama. Um, mm. I went and studied IT. Oh wow! And I did that for three. Yeah, I did that for three. My parents were adamant I must do something that can guarantee me a job. Mm. You know, they they thought that the other thing was a hobby at best. But if if they if they are to invest money into an education they felt that it should be something that can definitely pay back with like mm. a, a job that's well paying and at the time you know there was an it boom anyway so that's what i did um but then in my in my first in my first year i worked as an extra on on some of the soaps because mm. um the studios went far from my ca- from my campus so I would like sometimes do half the day at school and then go go be an extra on the set. And every time I was on a movie set or even a soap opera set, I'd just be so fascinated and so much of me would come alive, you know. And I would watch all those actors so carefully. I listened to every instruction those floor managers or, or the ADs were saying, camera, stand by, lights, or I don't know, roll camera. And I... That whole place, just, I loved it so much. Uh, and that's back in the year 2000. Um, sure. We're in, what, 2021 now? Yeah. And, yeah, so that was the beginning, me working as an extra. Um, and then in my third year, I got my first uh, leading role in a drama series called Cha Cha that was on SABC. Uh, yeah. And then, and so... Then I took two months off of uh, school and my, my, my practical in-service training to go and film that. And man, spending two months on a movie set as a professional actor just <laughs> blew my mind. I, lo- like, I loved so much of the work. You shoot 12 hours a day, but I was so energized all mm. day, every day, because this is something I'd been dreaming about for so long. And now here I was doing it and I uh, surrounded by other creatives and we were, you know, making movies, quote unquote. Yes, we're making a drama series. And then I went back to the, to the job I had at the time, which was I was doing an in-service training, which is basically your practicals, you know, that you do in your third year. And I knew then, it's like day one when I came back and I sat at my desk, I was like, just where I've been for the last two months, which was on, we were filming on location in the Eastern Cape uh, for, for Cha Cha. And uh, we, oh man, I was like, no, I know what I need to do. Mm. Uh, that's when I knew for a fact that I, yeah, that I must do this. Sure. That, that, that's, that sounds like perfect. Like, that's like the perfect, like, begin, like love story, beginning of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So who do you want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Tyler Perry. Mm. Oprah Winfrey. And Will Smith. Mm. Perfect trio. I could, yeah, I could work with them in a number of capacity. I don't have to be acting with them. Mm. They could, I don't know, we could, they could exec produce or co-produce or, uh, yeah. But it's, it's people, so people I, I enjoy and I would have to work with. So, so what have you watched recently that you know that you weren't in that that you enjoyed? I have, I have an answer for you. <laughs> so, I watched 
there's two titles um baby driver it's an mm. it's an old movie it's not recent but it 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 was such a uh, from a directing p- a perspective such a joy to watch mm. because this director went to town <laughs> you know um but in terms of story and performance there's a film called Manchester by the Sea mm. which is starring Casey Affleck Ben Affleck's brother and oh my gosh like it's set in a small oh. town uh, a tragedy but such a well told story both in terms of the script and and the actor which is obviously working with, which is obviously uh, the director working well with that actor as well mm. they it was it's such a sweet um such a well told story mm. a- and i enjoyed a uh, there's a rom com always be my maybe now that actually that should go on top of my list <laughs> have you seen that one yes love it <laughs> i can't believe how much i loved that that movie <laughs> I can't get over how much I love it. And and uh the the only living boy in New York. Okay, so the only living boy in New York. Oh my gosh, it's so you have to see it like the guys people that are listening listen I loved that that movie. Um I found it on Amazon. Uh and I'm I'm quickly checking who the director is because the director of this film also made another hit which blew me away so let's quickly talk about the only living boy in new york okay that's so that's that's the feature film i mean the title seems a little cumbersome but oh my gosh how well written i really i really loved it i mean i i i enjoy thrillers and action but that's a it's a relationship drama i i really enjoyed it so so much so mark webb the director has also made 500 days of summer which blew me oh, away as well. Yes. I mean, I'm not a kind of typically a rom-com kind of guy, but the way he's made these movies, I was like, "Oh man." No, they really grip me and I, and I just yeah, I love brilliant storytelling. Yeah. Mm. You can see that comes through. So, okay, this is the question that we we ask everybody. But um who who was your first celebrity crush? It must be like a Jennifer Lopez. Gosh, oh. how old is Jennifer? <laughs> She's a like, hmm, mid 40s I would say. Is she not too young to be my first crush? <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I mean she was a fly you know, girl. Gen- 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 Jennifer st- started early right yeah she's been a, a lot around a while she was a dancer for janet jackson in the early 90s she was yeah she was was she not a fly girl Karen, you you're 10 years out <laughs> uh, well i she's don't know she's 51 baby uh, she looks like so 32 I, so, so yes <laughs> 40 you're right <laughs> You're so flipping right. She does look 32. <laughs> so I and she's like being enjoyed like her life, you know. She's married all the... No, no, no. She's she's 51. I'm I'm 38. I turn 39 next month. Uh, it makes sense, yeah. <laughs> so she was my crush. She and Nia Long. Oh, yes. Definitely. What was Nia Long in... I think she may have been in, in, in Boys the... in the Hood. Yes, yes, she was. No, I get, I get no? both of them. Yeah, but those, those, those are my, uh, and I'll probably work with them. Yes, you know, and uh, by then, you know, the crushes will be. <laughs> it's funny because in our in our business, it, it happens often. It's like. You meet people that were your heroes, and then mm. you'll be working with them. I remember one of the, the the movies that made a huge impact on me. There's a 1991 movie called Sarafina. Yes. Made by uh, Mbongen Ngema, uh, had written the the musical and directed the musical, and Daryl James Groot directed the feature film, which has mm. Whoopi Goldberg and Somizi and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, and I remember one day in 20, it could have been 2015, 
I, I started working on a new telenovela and uh, there was Mbongeni Ngema on set as one of my actors and I was directing him. Oh my God. And we continued to work together for the year, you know, so it happens like, if I work with Eddie Murphy <laughs> next year or, uh, yeah, it, or Martin Lawrence, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, yeah, people well, who were your heroes, you know, growing up. Uh, but isn't yeah. that amazing? Like looking back and thinking about it and being like, if young me had to know, you know, what my life that, would that be. What, yeah. <laughs> Look, talk to me in, uh, let's say, a, a year or two years time and I'll be happy to look back. Yeah. To say, oh my gosh, I just worked with so and so and so and so. Yeah. Like to say, oh, uh, Wesley Snipes was on my, was on my set uh, or I was working with him. Or he came onto my movie, you know, for like a few days. That would be fun to look back and, and mm. reflect on, yeah. But Susanda, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. This was a very lovely chat, and I can't wait to catch up on everything that you suggested in this conversation. Thank you. I've really enjoyed uh, doing this with you as well. I can't wait till we do another one. That was our interview with Susanda Hena. You can find him on Instagram at, at Susanda underscore Hena and on Twitter at Susanda Hena. He's really active on both and he's just amazing. He's been in like everything. So you can find his work on Netflix, on Showmax. I will link in the show notes, of course, to everything discussed. But yeah, that was a lovely interview and a lovely conversation with both him and Waylene. We've just been so lucky when it co- when it's come to guests like someone from who like wow some, <laughs> someone as up and coming as and popular as Waylene and someone who is as established in the industry as Susanda like girl we have been lucky so yeah but at the same time I don't know if you I don't know if you saw some comments on social media where someone said like it's so cute how you whenever whenever you've got a new guest or someone um, shows up for your podcast then you seem so you seem so shocked but like why this is a good podcast <laughs> this is a good thing that you're doing <laughs> what do you mean shocked? And, like, and then when, when they like pop in on the zoom and i'm like oh my god i didn't know you were gonna be here no <laughs> <laughs> no novels. I, I do like, kind of know you know, i plan i prep <laughs> <laughs> you mean i'm, I'm shocked yeah. that they would want to be on the podcast there we go. Yeah, yeah because so, we like a young young like, podcast. I didn't think people know we all want to be on this like little fresh. Scrap, scrappy little podcast. But um, <laughs> it, it's it's been really humbling and it's been really nice. And we have even more amazing guests lined up for you guys. So, so exciting. You know, we're putting in the work. And the love. We're hustling. You know, like if you looked at me, if you ever looked at me, like I'm like the least hustler looking person in the world. I'm like hunchback and like hide under <laughs> tables type. And like you think like uh, this year I've I've been like hustling for guests with this podcast, like yes. jumping in people's DMs. Like this is this has been the biggest like um move out of my comfort zone <laughs> ever. But anyway, Rebecca, how have you been? Good. Um, it's been a it's been a busy week, first week of March. Um, but I've managed to miss some sleep and watch continue watching Crazy Ex Girlfriend. I finished it, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously I'm I'm obsessed now. And also, Weird Al Yankovic shows up at Is some it? point. Like, yeah, so that was fun. You should watch my week. Uh, it's a cancelled show, and I actually don't know if you where it would be on, but. There's a show called um, Gallivant. It's like a okay. medieval show, but it's like oh, comedy and musical, and it's hilarious. Um, weird, weird Al pops up in there also, but it's so funny. Um, Jeez, but Weird Al is such a blast from the past, don't you think? Like, didn't we used to? We were like heavy fans when we were fifteen or something. Yeah, but we also discovered him late. Like, he'd been famous since like the eighties. I remember when like, yeah. I discovered him like randomly on YouTube or like we discovered him. And then I told my sister about him. She's like, everybody knows about Weird Al Young. And I'm like, <laughs> have you seen this guy? He has this parody of, um, what is that song? Um, the one from, oh, it's on the Justice. 
but they're from from dangerous minds uh, as you walk through the as you walk through the, the valley, valley of, of the, the shadow, shadow of death, death yeah i'll take a look at my life what's it so <laughs> cool you know what i mean but yeah, that, yeah um oh you spared it of that the listeners can tell you <laughs> about after this I'll, I'll google it but um uh. yeah i know that was the funniest thing i've ever seen in my life but what have you been crashing on this week other than crazy ex girlfriend that that's all i've been watching that's all i've had time to watch what have you been, oh, so what have you been crashing on yeah um, <laughs> so i've also like i've been watching a lot of you love island it's south africa which is terrible but um, if you guys want to hear more about my thoughts on it, we have mini episodes coming out where I talk to different Love Island fans about like the week's episodes of the show and, and who they're liking and who they're not. So I'm not going to talk too much. But it is quite addictive and it's quite interesting to see how some African people in dating situations deal. We haven't had like a proper, other than The Bachelor, a proper dating show with like a lot of people interacting with each other in a long time yeah. like even date my family it's like you know specific people all the all the african shows they like select people for you it's not it's not the same um but also but like to contact that uh, so the african show i have enjoyed is tackers which is like a, a drama series it's like about five episodes or something like that and um it's really well made and it was thrilling from beginning to end i was addicted so sander's actually in that show like in the interview i i like i fangled a bit about it he's like karen i know you like jackers it's okay <laughs> like he's, he's really good in there but but the show itself is brilliant and i really love okay. it okay probably one of the best South african shows i'd ever seen but yeah but otherwise guys you can find me on instagram at karen walby on twitter at karen walby's sign up for my newsletter wildstreams.substack.com um guys don't forget to subscribe to the show on youtube we have more exclusive content coming soon more roundtables and that kind of stuff so yeah don't forget to sign up for our youtube and and when you um when you listen to the show share it on instagram and tag us please let people know about it we appreciate like all tags all messages everything so the podcast can be found at at crushing on pod on twitter instagram and facebook you can find more information about this and all our other episodes at our website crushingonpodcast.com and send any feedback to crushingonpod at gmail.com join our facebook group crushing on club where we chat about the show celebrity news recommendations the whole shebang let us know what you think about what was discussed in this week's episode by sending us a voice note or email to crushing on pod at gmail.com the show is produced by me karen and rebecca barches the show is edited and engineered by rebecca barches our logo was designed by nathifa maruf and the show was created in partnership with IG in Africa. If you like the show, tell everyone that you can any way that you can. Keep up to date with all our episodes by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate and review the episodes on Apple Podcasts, as it helps others find the show. We'll be back next week with another in-depth conversation with a pop culture lover. See you then. See you then.